guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Redskins lost again yesterday. Also here is Christian Harloff. Giants won again yesterday. <laughs> Also, here is Mark Ellis. Let's talk movies. <laughs> <laughs> but movies. All right. To celebrate Batman Day this past Saturday, Zack Snyder took to Twitter to reveal the first look at J.K. Simmons' Commissioner Gordon from Justice League. Snyder has been giving fans a ton of exclusive looks at the film from his Twitter account, like he did last week when he revealed Batman in full tactical gear from the movie. Justice League opens in theaters on November 17, 2017. John, what do you think of the first image of J.K. Simmons as Commissioner Gordon. Now, I would have liked to have, for my first um, exposure, if you will, to J.K. as as Commissioner Gordon, I would have liked to seen a close-up shot of him, you know, the gr grizzly mustache and the overcoat. I, I kind of would have dug that. But if we're not going to do that, we're going to get a wider shot. This is awesome. This picture is incredible. It's like right out of the pages of a comic book. It looks beautiful. And what, when you think of Commissioner Gordon, what iconic image would you think of other than Gordon standing by, you know, the bat signal on top of the roof? Now, granted, the bat signal is in and of itself is probably the stupidest form of communication, uh, especially in the modern age, because you throw up the bat signal, it's like every criminal in, in Gotham, is like, oh, Batman's going to be there in about five minutes. Right. Let's just go, I don't know, let's go take out the building or something. But but whatever, let's, let's just roll with it for a second. Let's just suspend disbelief. It's so iconic. This image is amazing and incredible. And look, I don't want to get too excited over, you know, we always talk about stuff like this. It's one single image. So we don't want, don't want to get carried away. But talking about one single image, this just gets my blood flowing. This looks amazing. I cannot wait to see, what, like stylistically, the approach they take with this film. Anyway, Christian, you talk, took a look at the image. What do you think? I love this image because I think that what we always say is J.K. Simmons has now become a, a name to, obviously with Whiplash, where, where more mainstream people obviously know his name, know who he is. He's, he's so much more than just a character actor. So a lot of times when they cast someone that you start to recognize a lot more, you go, oh, it's gonna be a little harder for me to see that person. You see this picture, I don't even know that's J.K. Simmons, but I know immediately that it's Gordon. Yes. I know immediately yeah. that that's Gordon. Just from the bat scene looking up, it looks like it looks like Gordon. It looks like, like you said, right out of the comics. It's I love the fact that it's in black and white. This is an this, this image to me is everything I want to see in Gordon. So I, I'm 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 optimistic of the look of Gordon. Mark. Oh yeah, I mean, I actually appreciate this version more than if it was an up close version of J.K. Simmons because right. I don't want to see J.K. Simmons. Like Christian said, I want to Good see point. Commissioner Gordon and I love the bad signal. It is so iconic, like you said, John, the bad signal next to Commissioner Gordon, just chilling, looking at his watch, just waiting. <laughs> like, I hope he's not in the bad cave because he probably won't see this. You're right. We saw Bruce Wayne use email a lot in Batman versus <laughs> Superman. Send the guy an instant message, you know, drop him do something that's more technologically savvy, but nothing that's updated looks as cool as the bat signal. Yeah. So you should keep it in there for no other reason. And maybe here's where they're going with this is that it scares the crap out of criminals that's what I'm in saying. Gotham yeah. City. Yep. It's Good less point. about, hey, Batman, we're in trouble. It's more about, hey, guys, somebody's watching over you. You're never sure where he is, but you damn well know he's coming if you do bad yeah. things. Yeah, I'm going the other way with you guys. I think it's still, it's great because you don't know how many of them there is. It's not just one on one building. You know, they, they probably have a bunch of these things, a bunch of the bat symbols. You, you throw it up in the air and, and just scatters them like ants. It's like the stupid ones stick around like, okay, bring it, Batman. Mm -hmm. They get right. they get thrown to Arkham. So I love the fact that they keep doing it. I think that it's it's the iconic thing. I, you guys aren't saying get rid of it, but I just think Oh no, not could, at all. I love could, it. Yeah, right. keep it. But you could still but you could still use it in a way to where it's like, okay, throw it up there. You guys you wanna all right, so you want to rob that 7 Eleven? Fine. Here you go, <laughs> stupid. You're right, and it is, it's iconic and it's a symbol to the city that, hey, yeah. Batman is here. Which kind of makes me laugh a little bit at the one line of Clark Kent in Justice League when he says, and some of the police may be helping him. 
the police commissioner on top of the police building flashes the bat signal in the sky. You think maybe he's working with them? He, he's not the best reporter in the world. Right? <laughs> One of the other cool things that came out around the story was J.K. Simmons did an interview, might have been last week or a while ago, where he talked about how, you know, Commissioner Gordon isn't going to have a huge role in Justice League per se, but here's the interesting he said, thing he said. He said, you get to see Gordon and how his interactions with Batman are a bit. Oh, and his interactions with the rest of the Justice League. And I just, I, I want to see J.K. Simmons as a grizzled, you know, Commissioner Gordon and not be the slightest bit impressed by The Flash, not be the slightest bit impressed by Wonder Woman or Cyborg or whatever. I just... I'm looking I want to see to him make you smell like fish jokes at Aquaman and see how it plays. <laughs> All right, what's next? According to a report from Australia's Herald Sun, a Mad Max Fury Road prequel is reportedly not only in the works, but could start filming in Australia as soon as this year with George Miller returning to the helm. That let also states the movie will focus on the backstory of Furiosa, played by Oscar winner Charlize Theron. Mark, what do you think about a Mad Max prequel centered on Charlize Theron's Furiosa character? Love it, man. I mean, I walked into the theater for Mad Max Fury Road and was ready to see Mad Max and I walked out like yeah Mad Max was awesome but so is Furiosa and I think that her backstory particularly when she meets up with the other gaggle of women in the middle of the movie right. it's like what is their backstory what is that relationship going to be so if this is focusing on her I am so on board for it I think Charlize Theron is on board for it too so I think even she was a little taken aback at how positive the response was to her character and they're like people love watching that character on the big screen anytime you get me into this world again I'm going to be happy the fact that Furiosa is going to be front and center once again makes me even more excited christian uh, i love it and i'll tell you it's george miller directing yeah that's that's the word that's is. report so I, look he's a person who's not taken aback because he said as far as how popular <laughs> it should be because he he had said that he had ideas for this that right. he had these ideas, so it makes sense that it's going into production this fast because it's his mind that's been working around this character. We saw how well she came to life on screen because of what he put into it and what he obviously will put into it and what Charlize Theron was able to give and breathe life into this character. So I'm super excited about to see how she got where she was. And I think it'll even heighten the experience even more so with, with Fury Road, which is a great movie all by itself, but it will add a little bit more once you know it. Now, you don't always need backstory for a character. Sometimes the mystery is great and the mystery you just alone, but I think that Furiosa could be that character of how did she get where she is? Because I think it's going to carry on past Fury Road after it. I think it's a nice setup to go, essentially, mm. this is part one, right. Fury Road mm -hmm. is two, and then the third one. It's a nice way to tell the story. What what's adds an extra layer of interest to this is the fact that, we got to remember, there are several places reporting this, but it's not been confirmed. So at this point, we just got a, call it a, a semi-informed rumor at this point. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is George Miller, not all that long ago, he confirmed himself. He said, you know, the next one's going to be uh, Mad Max The Wasteland. And there were a couple of scripts, and neither of them were Furiosa-focused, and they were more sequels. Now we're hearing that, oh, no, 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 this is the thing going to production. All Furious, apparently, uh, Tom would not be involved in it. And that's not terribly surprising, because a lot of the reports we got from set were that Charlize and Tom Hardy did not get along but very well. But he apologized, well. though, afterwards. That's to true. Both yeah, of them. I yeah. Heard, I heard about that. But, mm. but it's still not surprising right. that maybe they'd want to go in a direction to Furiosa without Mad Max. Look, it's a risk whenever you take a franchise like this and move away from the titular character, right? So, because this is Mad Max, and you're not going to have Mad Max. But you're right. I think it caught the studio by surprise. I think it caught the audiences by surprise. And I think it caught Charlize Theron like, completely by surprise how well Furiosa played with the audience and how much we left the theater going, we want to see more with her in it. So if this does come to pass, I'm really excited. I can't wait to see where they go with it. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Sully enjoyed a second straight weekend atop the box office, taking in 22 million for the number one spot. The much anticipated horror sequel, Blair Witch, fell short of many predictions, pulling in 9.7 million for the number two spot. The third chapter in the Bridget Jones franchise, Bridget Jones Baby, made 8.2 million for the number three spot. The third wide release, Oliver Stone's Snowden, came in at number four with 8 million. And at number five, Don't Breathe, 5.6 million. Christian, why do you think Blair Witch underperformed at the box office? I think it's a little mixture of both. I think that it didn't do great critically, and I also think that you know there's some people that didn't buy into the hype that a lot of people did at Comic Con. You know, like the, the Comic Con marketing definitely hit people in our industry for sure, but a lot of other people may. And I had said this when we were talking about it with Blair Witch, if they would have just said 
hey, we're doing another Blair Witch movie. People would have just groaned. Ugh. But the way that they did it and the way that they marketed yeah. the comic kind of made sense. A lot of people didn't catch on to that. And I think that they got that groan of, ah, why do I need to see another one? And then the buzz was just okay at best. Uh, so that's why I think it, di it didn't do that well. It certainly wasn't going to have the same kind of impact that the first one did. I don't think anybody was expecting it to. The one that stands out the most, 100%, is Sully. I mean, the, that's that is a nice little drop off. What thirty thirty? I think thirty seven was thirty seven percent. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought that was going to happen? And that is again because of the the buzz, the word of mouth. It's a shorter length film, so it, it is. It's a movie that I'm glad is doing well. I still haven't seen. It. I got to go and check it out. The one that I'm actually surprised didn't do better is Bridget Jones's Baby. The reason being that that is a movie that. It, it has I look I still that's another one I, I'm gonna go check out because I've heard good things about it the second one was atrocious first it's one was better okay. than you'd think did you see it yeah yeah it's better and, than you and that's and I think because there are not a lot of romantic comedies and this actually is not gonna help the case romantic comedies are just not doing good these days they're not there's not a lot of them that just pop and to get a good one again in the theater speaking of people who have seen it it's a little disappointing that it didn't do well but maybe that it's just that genre isn't just working right now yeah, with, with Blair Witch, I think, you know, some people I heard talking online saying, oh, so the big announcement they did at Comic-Con didn't work. I beg to differ, because they don't do that at Comic-Con. This movie opens to three and a half totally or four million agree. dollars. Yep. I mean, honestly, because, look, that, I don't think you can over-exaggerate truly how horrible that second Blair Witch movie was. I mean, it, it was, le that's yeah. the type of movie that's so bad you write songs about it. It's epically awful on mm. every single level. Like, I can't imagine you intentionally making a movie worse than the way that, I mean, it was just terrible. And it soured the name of the Blair Witch for a lot of people for a long time. What they did with their marketing stunt, and I mean stunt in a very positive way, was they got people that never would have been interested in Blair Witch again interested in it. Yeah, did it fall short of what they were hoping? Absolutely, I'm sure that it did. But had they not done it, handled the marketing the way they handled it, could have been much worse. It also might have helped them a little bit if they released Blair Witch a little bit closer to when they dropped that bomb at Comic Con. Mm -hmm. So if that, when they made that big reveal, oh my gosh, and then the movie opens two weeks later, this movie probably opens to $15 million. Instead, a couple of months pass and they run out of time. Sully, 37% drop, unbelievable, that's great. And I'm just really excited to see Don't Breathe after, who would have thought? When this movie was coming out, don't breathe that after four weeks it would still be in the top five. So I'm I'm really excited about that. Anyway, what did you see in there, Mark? Well, I mean, this was the second most disappointing thing I saw yesterday because I was rooting for Blair Witch a lot because I really liked the movie and I thought it was a great re-entry into that, you know, mythology, if you will, from nineteen ninety-nine. The good news is it only costs $5 million to make, so it's already made a profit. I'm not going to hide behind that. It's a bummer that more people didn't go out and see Blair Witch. I think it is a good film. I didn't see Bridget Jones. I have no idea uh, if that's a good movie or not. You put a rom-com. I'm excited about it. You put a baby in there for me. Not so much. I was impressed by Snowden's $8 million take. Because it was under 2,500 screens. I didn't think it'd do that well. It didn't have a lot of buzz going in. The fact that it still was top five, I think, is admirable in its own right. Suicide Squad also hanging in there at just under $5 million. It's one of those movies that keeps making a nice little haul weeks and weeks and weeks after it was released. It's like up so, to like $714 million worldwide yeah, now, which yeah. is nothing to sniff at. And I'm really impressed by Sully hanging on there as well as it did, too. I've just never heard the expression that a movie's so bad, people write songs about it. Like, <laughs> yeah, they got the kid from Stranger Things singing. <laughs> yeah. That guy's so talented. He's so I hate good. Him now. And you know, one other thing too about Don't Breathe. This is the other thing to keep in mind. Don't Breathe this week crossed the hundred million dollar mark, mm -hmm. made for less than ten million dollars. They made the movie for wow. nine point nine million dollars. Yeah, can you smell sequel? All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? THR reports that Tom Cruise and Paramount are nearing an official close to their deal after a contentious contract dispute halted pre-production on Mission Impossible 6 earlier this summer. The project was heading toward a January 2017 start. Sources now tell THR that all the issues have been resolved and MI6 is headed for a spring 2017 start time with Rogue Nation helmer Christopher McQuarrie writing and directing. John Byer saw the news that MI6 is back on track with Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt. Oh, oh, big buy. This is a movie that has to get made. They need to do it both paramount needs it 
Yeah, Tom Cruise needs it. But I remember when there was this, when the dispute happened, and I kind of take a sports mentality on, on the whole thing, because at the time, what was being reported, and we don't know how accurate this was, but what was being reported was that Tom Cruise wanted the kind of money that Universal was giving Tom Cruise to appear in their new shared monster cinematic universe, and he thought he should get that kind of money for doing Mission Impossible 6. What I tried to bring up in that whole scenario was, well, Tom, here's the thing. Let's say you're a really talented point guard and there's a team out there that needs a point guard desperately because they have terrible point guards. They need one desperately. They may be willing to pay you $20 million because you're worth $20 million to that particular team because they need it so badly. But with another team that maybe has already one all-star point guard or two all-star point guards, you're still the same player but you're not worth that much to them because they already have an abundant supply. Universal needed big star power. They have broke the bank. They went out and got Russell Crowe, Johnny Depp, Tom Cruise because they needed to make a splash with this new cinematic universe they're trying to create and get off the ground. That doesn't necessarily mean you're, the, you're worth that same amount to every single franchise. That being said, I am super happy this has gotten done. This is a movie that we all want to see. They have picked up their game on the Mission Impossible franchise so much. I haven't been let down by the last couple at all, so this is great news to me. Huge buy. Christian, what do you think? A huge buy for me. It's funny because I want to agree and disagree with you at the same time here because your analogy is spot on, but I think Paramount did need him as that point guard. Absolutely needed him as that point guard because Mission Impossible is like one of their top franchises and they revitalized that thing the same way that they did or Universal did with Fast and the Furious. Mission Impossible has gotten better and better each movie. And you're like, wait, how is that possible? It should have just farted out a long time ago, but it didn't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it, it, it didn't. And the movies are getting better. So it's like, why would you let that franchise go? Because how many, besides Star Trek and now Mission Impossible, what other big franchises is Paramount really have you know um, so grab him and I, I was saying when we reported on the story last time pay him he deserves to be paid because he's one of those guys out right now that is able he's a full-fledged movie star and he gives hundred and ten percent every time you cannot find a performance from Tom Cruise to where he's not invested from beginning to end and if he's hot right now get him so that's why I think this is smart I think it's, it's it was negotiations it was something whoever wanted to do it whether it's Tom Cruise's side or or Paramount's side they wanted to say Hey, this is going on right now. Fine. We all know about it, but it, you knew it was going to come. It, it had to come to a head, so I'm glad it did. Mark. Huge buy. You pay the man. If for no other reason, can we put that picture back up? Look at this image of a guy who's about to strap himself to the side of an airplane. <laughs> There's only one guy excited about this, and it's Tom Cruise. Look at the petrified look of everybody else in that picture. They're like, oh my God, this guy's going to die. Tom Cruise like, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great for the movie. You pay that guy whatever he wants, because in addition to how crazy he is, his name is also Tom Cruise. So whether he's going to be in the Mummy reboot or whether he's going to be in another Mission Impossible, you need that guy to lead your franchise and if Paramount wanted any evidence as to why they should pay Tom Cruise whatever he wants you don't need to look any further than one of the other stars of the Mission Impossible movies that would be Jeremy Renner look what happened when they put Jeremy Renner as the lead in a Bourne movie people were like ah oh, no Matt Damon I'm not sure about this anymore same thing if Mission Impossible happens without Tom Cruise you gotta have him in there if you want to make a buttload of money it's gonna be awesome now that Tom Cruise is back well it also didn't help that that particular Bourne movie wasn't as good as any of the other Bourne movies right. that probably had something to do with but I do want to challenge this this philosophy of pay him whatever he wants. Just just pay Not the man. Not whatever he wants. Because but. when you look at Paramount this year, especially even if you go into last year too, Paramount has had some very high profile money losers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at something like Bridget Jones, right, like something that had a strong franchise going, just because it was strong before, you can't make the assumption it's going to be strong financially moving forward. And we just saw it kind of do disappointing numbers at the box office. I think if you're Paramount at this point, you're like, look. That extra 20 million could be the difference between everybody getting their Christmas bonuses and some executives getting fired this year. So I, I think we gotta be really careful because I know a lot of fans just go, ah, if he wants 200 million, just give it to him. And I know that's not what you're saying right. at all. But it's just that we gotta be really careful and see it from the studio's point of view sometimes that, man, Paramount's had some movies come out this year that you just automatically think, it's gonna make money. The new Star Trek Beyond, it's gonna make money. It lost the money. You know, and so they want to be a little bit cautious. So they need I, Tom Cruise even and they more. Need, they yeah, no, they Tom absolutely Cruise need and Bridget Jones's baby. But that's what I'm saying. <laughs> also, you have you have these movies that let's say whether it's Star Trek or even like Bridget Jones, by the way, and and he's and I don't know if this is uh, Zoolander. I think was Universal, but whatever. Ooh. Taking too long to get there. Bridget yes. Jones might be another reason. Yes. Taking too long absolutely. to get there. Mission Impossible is not that far. I mean, the last one came out last year, the year before, whatever. And so 
grab it now while you still have the Absolutely. momentum. That's kind of where where I'm saying because there are other like Star Trek. You lost J.J. Abrams behind it too, and that's not necessarily why the movie didn't do as well as it did. But it did also well, those two movies came out in a time where there were new, there were no more Star Wars movies being made. Right, and I do think that the Star Wars franchise definitely hurt it a little bit for sure. I actually really loved Star Trek Beyond, uh, the Last Beyond. I yeah, thought it was so did one I, of the yeah. best ones. But I think that you lock in crews when you can on a franchise that has proven it's making money the last two um, the, the last two, two installments. Yes. Yeah, I just think, look, absolutely, Paramount needed to get Tom Cruise back. But I think even when you need something, you have to be cautious about how much. Because for all we yeah. know, Cruise was asking for $150 million. Yeah, and that yeah, would yeah. be ridiculous. Or maybe not. I'm just glad they got the deal done because I want my next Mission Impossible movie to have Tom Cruise in it. And... You know, the reality is the, the clock is ticking on Tom Cruise action movies, and I feel like he's just hit his stride. I, I can't wait for Jack Reacher. I don't care what you say. Well, look, I mean, that's the hard thing about Paramount is that they're negotiating with Jack Reacher, and as we all know from the sequel, he never goes back. Will the, will the Three Stooges <laughs> pop up again in this one? I wonder? God, I hope so. I, I love that scene. Oh, all right, what's it. next? We learned last fall that there are more Fast and Furious movies on the way, with two more sequels dated for 2019 and 2021. And while Furious 7 seems to give a proper send-off to Paul Walker's Brian O'Connor, there's a chance he may come back before the franchise comes to an end. Caleb and Cody Walker were speaking with Entertainment Tonight, discussing a fundraising event called Game for Paul. And during the interview, Caleb had this to say. I had a phone call with Vin for about an hour, and we really discussed this a while back. He wanted our blessing. Diesel asked if it would be acceptable to maybe bring Paul's character back to really kind of let his fans know he's still out there. Mark Byersell, Paul Walker's character returning to a Fast and Furious sequel. I would buy it in a in a limited dosage because obviously you can't have Paul Walker himself return to the movies anymore. But just to give the fans a little nod that he's out there somewhere, I think that's I, I think that'd be a nice way to go. I don't think it's necessary going forward in the Fast and Furious movies, but as just as a tip of the cap. To to everything that Paul Walker brought to that franchise. I think it might be nice to have a scene with him interacting somehow uh, it, because they proved that with the end of the last Fast and Furious movie, you can cheat it at least a little bit. So yeah. I think if you do that going forward, it might be a nice nod to the fans. Christian? I'm going to sell it. I just think it, it makes me nervous. It just, it, and I think that it, the last movie did it so beautifully, and it was, it made sense. Sure. He was filming the movie. The way that they did it, just the, the, car, the car ride out, the nod off to everyone else, it brought tears to the eyes of people in the theater too, and it was a nice send off to the character. I think by doing it now, you're gonna get, even if it's not the intent, I'm not saying it is, that you're gonna get the comments of they're cashing in on, on this on this guy's death. They're they're trying to get more and I and I'm not saying I'm not saying that they they wouldn't be paying homage to him also by putting him in there again, but I think we did that so nice in the last one that I don't necessarily think that you need to do it. Now I think you could just give his brothers a role in the film as well if you want to get them involved also if you want to do it you know write them in a new character but i don't think it makes a lot of sense to do this i'm gonna i'm gonna disagree with you okay. here i'm gonna buy this and i think we are far beyond i think there's enough time now that has passed between the unfortunate passing of Paul Walker, and now that anybody with an above idiot IQ would think that the studio was trying to cash in on it. Like if it was the weeks following his death or whatever. And I think a lot of us were very impressed with the way the studio handled, you know, first of all, how they completed the movie and then how they marketed the movie. Because never once did I ever get the, the, the sense that they were cashing in on the passing of Paul Walker and the notoriety that brings. I thought they handled it so, with so much class and with so much dignity. Now that being said, when you understand the role that Paul Walker's character had in this world and that they are literally he is literally now family with with Vin's character, it would it would seem out of place and odd that at no point would even a phone call happen or some kind of consultation. But like you were pointing out, the way the movie ends, it would also feel out of place to bring the character back into action. That would undo everything they just right. did in the previous movie. And I agree with you on that. But like you were saying, Mark, I think a phone call, uh, a, a, a video Skype chat for a moment, just to remind the, the people that, hey, this is Vin's best friend and the father to his nephew. It would make sense that maybe some kind of phone call or a conversation at some point, I don't think it'll feel forced and I don't think people will see it as a cash-in, but it's gotta be small. 
it's got to be almost a cameo. He can't become a lead character. Or you're right. It undoes that beautiful yeah. send-off. You can mention him. You can mention him. I, mean, I think that's something because now we have the ability to do these things with technology, and as it keeps getting better, you know, the the Hank Pym, the Tony Stark stuff that they started to do this, the aging stuff, and how they will eventually be able to bring in characters that have passed on. I think they don't get reliant on it. You can mention, and fans will understand, if you mention that his character is off doing this or has done this or sends his regards or sends his love, fans will go, I get it. We understand why you had to do it that way. And that's it. I just think that you you start to go into waters that are just a little murky. He could also appear on screen, but not like a Skype call. Uh, yeah, but, but again, I, I agree with Christian that if you actually use him as a marketing tool in the movie, then that's yeah, catching that's, in. That's that bad. feels a little unsavory. But if he just like has some place in Barbados, and that's like where Vin Diesel needs to stash a couple of his family members while he goes off on this mission, I think that'd be fine. You know, it's like he's like, okay, I, we got to go off on this thing. But in the meantime, my two babies or whoever's kids are gonna go stay at somebody's place that's safe and then maybe at the end of the movie they just like high five for a quick second he you know say hi to the tykes i don't write these things i'm just saying it's an idea actually let me ask you if you went to go see the new uh, uh, the new fast and furious movie and a quick appearance by the paul walker character played yeah. probably by one of his brothers <laughs> Do you think that would be a nice emotional thing for the audience or would that actually pull you out of it and feel jarring to you? I think, think it would definitely pull me out of it. When I read this story, I, my mind immediately went to cash grab. It worked mm. last time. You know, it tugged on people's heartstrings. It was a nice send off. It was classy. This, it, it kind of sounds to me like they're going, trying to go down maybe like a, I think it's a money thing, honestly. So I'd rather just stay away from it. It worked last time. Just let it go, honestly. All right, let's move on. What's next? Focus Features has released a new trailer for Loving, the interracial marriage drama from Mud and Midnight special writer-director Jeff Nichols. Based on a true story, the film stars Joel Edgerton and Ruth Nagar as Richard and Mildred Loving, a Virginia couple who went up to D.C. to get married when faced intense discrimination in their home state, given that interracial marriage was against the law at the time. Loving opens in theaters on November 4th. Christian, buy or sell the new trailer for Loving. Oh man, huge buy. So uh, this trailer alone just emotionally got me just watching. I can only imagine what the full movie is going to do. I think we're going to get a lot of mentions, really a lot of buzz come Oscar season. But I think it's so relevant, especially with, with the landscape uh, today, what's happening in the world. But just to know where we started and as far as what, what was able to happen back then, what these two went through. And we're going to. We're going to get that in this movie. We're going to get it from the amazing performances we see in this trailer. And look what Joel Edgerton is doing. You feel it. And just that I can protect you. I can protect you. And I can say as it just as a, you know, for me as a husband, protecting my, my wife, my family, I know I can't even imagine what this guy oh. went through, you know. So to feel that this is going to be powerful. Not to mention what, um, oh, my God, the, the direct for uh, Midnight Special and uh, Jeff Nichols, Nichols. Nichols, Nichols uh, Mud. I mean. This guy, Jeff Nichols, what he's been doing as a filmmaker, I mean, this is this is one of our top stars as a director right now. And I haven't seen the movie yet, so I'm just I'm let's say that this thing is the Oscar contender that we think it could be. I haven't heard your, your thoughts on it yet, but that it could be. You look at what well, this is the way directors really build a legacy with the amount of different genres and stuff, the way that you pipe in stuff. He started out with just these, these tech, with, with mud and then moving on to Midnight Special, now doing a movie like this. Who knows what this guy's gonna do next? And it seems like he can do everything. So I'm banking off the fact that I think this movie's gonna be great based off the trailer, so I'd buy it. It's a huge buy for me. First of all, Joel Edgerton can, can do anything. He can do anything. Yeah. He can play any kind of role, you name it, he can do it. But here's the thing that really struck me about the trailer. And it's a little bit of background. When I moved, first of all, when you watch a movie like Free State of Jones, right? There's, and you see the, the terrible things one human being would do to another based on where they're from or the color of their skin or whatever. It's, it's shocking, but there's a little bit of a disconnect too because we're seeing people plowing their own fields right. for what they're gonna have for dinner. We see people getting in a horse and buggy, and so there's a bit of disconnect. When I first moved to Los Angeles, uh, my girlfriend at the, at the time was black. We had been dating for almost a year. I moved out to LA and I was gonna be here for a few months, go home for a few months, be here for a few months. The long distance thing was too much and we, we eventually broke up. But to, to think that just because of who I was dating, she or I could have been imprisoned. And here's the thing, there ain't horse and buggies in these pictures. Right. These are cars, this, is a, this was not that long ago. And I love it when movies like this will come along and remind us, you know what, we kind of live in an era right now where we are a much more enlightened culture now than we were. We still have a ways to go. 
but we forget that it wasn't that long ago where one white dude marrying one black woman can land both of their asses in jail. They, my grandparents were alive during the events of this movie. That's crazy to think about. And the way they seem to be handling the storytelling in it, I, I think is magnificent. I love the trailer for me, it's a big buy. And it took place in Virginia, which just, <laughs> I, God, I, it was tough watching this trailer because again, like the racist events that took place all over the South and even in my home state, it's just so awful to think that this happened as recently as it did. But one of the points of this trailer is to emphasize how somebody can stand up against what society is telling them to do mm. and be a good human being. Joel and Ruth, I think, both look like Oscar frontrunners after yeah. seeing this trailer. The movie comes out at the right time to be an Oscar contender. I agree with Christian, where Jeff Nichols is also one of those guys that should be on the short list of Oscar-nominated directors after this movie comes out. But and and I am happy to say, like this, th this gets taught in Virginia. Like I grew up being aware of this case because I grew up in Virginia, and it's just one of those things where it's like even Virginia and DC, they're right next to each other, but they were worlds apart. And I hope this movie illuminates that and helps us move forward and try to heal from this kind of stuff. All right, what's next? During an appearance at the DeVille Film, DeVille Film Festival, <laughs> Chloe Grace Moretz told The Hollywood Reporter that she has dropped out of all upcoming projects, including Universal's live action reimagining of The Little Mermaid. I pulled the plug on all my movies because I want to reassess who I am and find myself within my roles again. I'm realizing that I can slow down. John Byer saw Chloe Grace Moretz's decision to drop out of all her upcoming projects, including The Little Mermaid. I'm a little bit torn on it. I'm going to, I'm going to buy it because I, I'm thinking, look, I admire the fact that of her as an artist, she's stepping back and saying, look, I'm not happy with the direction my career is going right now. Maybe she's not happy with what she's doing herself. Maybe she's recognizing holes in her game or, or I, I mean, I don't know. And for somebody to have the fortitude to say, you know what, I'm going to step back as man in Hollywood. It's like out of sight, out of mind. That's risky to step out of project and then disappear from the public eye for a while. That's a risk. But if it's for those reasons, I actually admire what she's doing. Now, the reason I'm torn though, and I'm gonna buy it, the reason I'm torn though is because, you know, with this movie and with others, you made commitments to people to be involved and now they're counting on you and withdrawing. That's unfortunate that that happens, but but overall, I think if she's doing it because she thinks it's what's healthy for her career right now, then I'm gonna lean that way. So for me, it's gonna be a buy. Mark? Yeah, I'll buy it too, because it seems like it's healthy for her life right now. And we were actually talking right before we went to air just about child stars and how tough it is to grow up in the public eye. Yes. She certainly is one of those people and she was praised at how talented she was from a very early age. And so maybe she just wants to have some semblance of what a normal life would be for a little bit. I I mean, I can't speculate as to why she she wants to step away from her projects right now, but if it's for her mental health, then yeah, I'm all for it. Or even if it's just something as simple as exhaustion, because it's not just filming the movie, especially with The Little Mermaid, you're going all over the world to promote that. That yeah. movie does not stop and start when you're on set. You have to do so much work for Disney or any major blockbuster movie to go promote it, to go sell it, to do talk shows, to do all sorts of things. She doesn't want to be a part of that right now. She's looking at her schedule and being like, I just need some time off. Then I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm disappointed because I like her and I think she would have been great in The Little Mermaid. But if she's not cool with doing it for whatever reason, then let her step away. Christian. Uh, it's a huge buy for me, actually. Uh, good on her. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. here, here's the thing. She's 19 years old. Uh, remember when you were 19, the amount of decisions of where you think you were going when you were you know, 15, oh, I'm going to do this. And I'm and she's caught up in the Hollywood spotlight since she was a little kid. And then she's like, oh, I'm going to do this, this. And then she has a thought and goes, well, maybe I don't really like the way that I'm going about this. She got into like this ridiculous Twitter f uh, feud with, I don't know, one of the Kardashians. Can't oh, remember. yeah, I remember hearing And she that. wrote this whole thing about then she had, she was, first she went into this war, then she sat back and she, she had conversations with other people and she sat back and she said, I don't know, this is kind of what I want to do. I have to look at myself a different way. And I think she's just going through this different transformation all in general. Now, I will say I agree with you that I hope that it was handled correctly yeah. in how she <laughs> went, went about canceling, saying, no, thank you. Basically, telling them exactly this. Mm -hmm. I want to do different things with my career. I'm not leaving your project because I want to do another one. I'm leaving all of my projects because I want to do this. I think that's respectable. I think that that's something that if you if the, it's your career, you should be able to do that. And you should also give person like any other job, give them the time to either replace you or figure out if the thing was about to go into production next week and she did it, then that's a little, uh, stick to your commitments and then do your new plan. But it doesn't seem like that's what she did. But I commend her for wanting to just kind of reassess what she wants to do. I mean, look, when I was 19, I had it all worked out. 
I mean, I was <laughs> As we can tell. I mean, yeah, obviously, I, yeah, you have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was taking my biology classes. I'm like, I cannot wait for Dr. L to start operating on somebody. <laughs> By the way, I'm curious to know what you guys think. Let's put the camera back on Mark for a second. His favorite yes. words. How are you? Uh, I'd like, I'd like in Twitter, what do you think? What do you think? And start firing in these in on Twitter. What do you think Mark Ellis' shirt says? Because uh, we, we took a move around. Yeah, there you go. What do you think his is. shirt is actually saying? I'm curious to know. I know what the answer is now, but I'm curious to hear what you guys think You're about on Twitter. You're opening it up. Now, speaking, <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of Twitter, we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday. And as we're doing it live, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live questions if you're watching us live. How do you get those questions to us? Simple. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Just go to our Twitter page, make sure you're following us, and then fire in your questions, and then Wendy Lee is going to be picking out some of the questions that she thinks are the most worthy, and we'll address those near the end of the show. I'm also going to ask her to let us know some of the answers that you guys are throwing in, uh, <laughs> maybe with a bit of a fill. Wendy's already got a look on her face like she's reading that's, some of the stuff she's that's PG-13 there. over there. Uh, and hey, guys, don't forget, this isn't the only show that's coming on Collider <laughs> Video today. A little bit later today, we have the brand new TV talk, but also, last night, Following the Emmys, Josh McCuga, Dennis Zen, Perry, and uh, Roxy Starr did a Emmy follow-up show, and it's a great follow-up show. It's on our page right now. Just go to our homepage on YouTube, scroll down where TV Talk is. You'll find it there, and make sure you watch it. The, the crew there did a great job with a follow-up last night. All right, with that being out of the way, it is time for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime. <laughs> Send in your emails to collidervideo at gmail.com. Every day we pull a couple questions out. And we also have a mailbag show on Saturday and Sunday that takes your questions as well. So we're going to take a couple questions right now. Ashley, what do we got? Movie Paradise writes, I had a question about the Blair Witch film this weekend. Up until Comic-Con, it was simply titled The Woods, but then it was revealed to be a sequel to the Blair Witch Project. What would have happened if they never made that announcement and it went to theaters as The Woods and people didn't know it was related to the Blair Witch until they actually saw the movie? Is something like that unprecedented? Would it have gotten more media attention than the Comic-Con announcement and how would it have affected its opening weekend box office? Would it be lower but com compensate for it in its second week. Thanks and keep bringing that filthy. You know, it's a really interesting theoretical scenario. Personally, I think it would have been disastrous because, you know, when we got to that point at Comic-Con when the woods was really revealed to be the Blair Witch, nobody was talking about the woods. Nobody I, I, nobody was buzzing about it. Nobody was really interested. Even when you went to the, like the hardcore horror sites, even they weren't really talking about this new horror film coming out called The Woods. So you come out with it as that and just let it get revealed organically, I think it would have hurt the film. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it would have gone completely the other way. And there's certainly an argument to be made for that. I just think the way they did it probably benefited the film uh, as is. I don't know, Christian, it's a really interesting scenario they bring up. What do you think? It's interesting, but I agree with you 100%. Um, I think that it's too risky because, look, even though it didn't do the money that we, uh, Mark certainly hoped it would have made, or it, it the, you have a brand with Blair Witch. Yeah. It's a brand name. The Woods is, huh? What What is the Woods? And then the other is thing that's going to happen. Is it follow up to Cabin in the Woods? Yeah, but the other thing that you'd have to do, remember, is you'd have to, if you wanted to hold this secret out, you'd have to then tell critics, oh, we're not screening it. We're not going to screen yeah. it. And then if you don't screen it, then they're like, well, what does that mean? Does it stink? Oh, the Woods probably stinks, so I don't want to see it. And I think you cut, I think you probably do maybe $4 million opening weekend because you don't have any buzz on it whatsoever. You don't have any hype. For the people who did enjoy the the, new, the Blair Witch, they're talking about it. They're saying about it. And other Blair Witch fans want to go and check it out. The Woods is just like, oh, what was that? Oh, it was a Blair Witch movie? Oh, okay. And then you forget about it with other releases. And so the other thing, too, is you play, once you start playing the trailers, Everyone's going to go, this looks like a Blair Witch rip ripoff. Right. That's exactly what they would have said. Or you and don't show trailers and then you get no marketing <laughs> yeah, on it. Yeah. Marketing. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I think the trailers, unless they did something <laughs> really cool, because they only spent $5 million making this movie, so if they wanted to sink another million dollars into filming some stuff that looked like a horror movie that was not the actual movie, that would have been switch. awesome. Yeah, I mean, personally, as a fan, I would have loved to have been in a theater and not known and been like, oh my God, it's a sequel to the Blair Witch. This is awesome. I would have stood up and applauded. But all that being said, I think the biggest risk with releasing it as The Woods, well, it's twofold. One is that we had a movie come out this past January called The Forest, and so it's very similar to that. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. So then the other thing is it will eventually come out 
and people will spoil it opening weekend if it didn't already get spoiled in a press screening that it's in fact a Blair Witch sequel. So once that happens, some public might get very excited about going to see the Blair Witch. Some other ones may be like, well, why are they hiding the fact that it's a Blair Witch? Right. It almost is like they're embarrassed that it's a Blair Witch movie mm. and they didn't want yeah, that to get point. out there. They were trying to sell it off the basis of the woods and trying to separate itself from Book of Shadows or whatever else. So I think that it was the right play going forward, although selfishly, I would have loved to have been in a theater and I'd still love that experience at some point. Just going to watch something that I think is one thing and then finding out, like we go see like some Stallone movie and it ends up being a sequel to Tango and Cash. That would be <laughs> awesome. I, yeah. You know what? I also think they kind of dropped the ball on it. Maybe they did it and I just went under the radar, but one of the big things with the original Blair Witch was that fake kind of documentary they did. I think mm -hmm. it was on Sci-Fi or whatever, too. The mockumentary the on Sci-Fi. I thought it was right. real Everybody when I watched did. it. Everybody did. I know it's a different type of marketing from then to now, but they sh after that Comic-Con announcement, they should have put another thing out. They should have done yeah. something to where they try to do some viral marketing, viral campaigns for it on just to see, like, like treating it as if it was real and, oh, these other kids kind of went it and, like, building up the hype a little more. It was the Comic-Con thing, and I think we talked about it earlier. It was the Comic-Con thing, then it was gone, and then the release happened. There was no buildup in between to kind of capitalize on that marketing. All right, now before we get into this final mailbag question today, it does revolve around Captain America Civil War. If, I mean, I don't know if you would be interested in this movie, how you haven't seen it yet is beyond me, but <laughs> if you have not seen it yet, there's a little bit of a spoiler in the question itself for Captain America Civil War. We're gonna have the spoiler alert up until we get to the Twitter questions. So you have indeed been warned. Ashley, what is the next question? Jameson Mosey writes, hey Collider, while I think we can all agree that we thought Captain America Civil War was amazing, there is one thing I just really can't look past that the movie didn't do. Why and they kill off War Machine. The movie is called Civil War and not a single lead or secondary character died in this movie. There's no way he could have survived that free fall from that height in a damaged Iron Man suit and it would have improved the setup to the, f the final battle between Captain America and Iron Man in the last act with Tony losing his best friend and either realizing what a big mistake he's made or it would have fueled him more to fight Captain America. Yeah, okay, so let's, 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 let's just call it what it is. When you, I believe the rate of acceleration when you're free falling is seven feet per second per second. So your rate of descent increases seven feet per second per second. That checks fall. out with my math as well, John. <laughs> <laughs> my, my brain shut down at numbers. <laughs> and maybe Mark, you can help me. I believe, sure. I believe when you've hit the maximum speed of falling that you can in our atmosphere, I believe that's called, is that terminal velocity? Getting terminal velocity here. It's also a great film with Charlie Sheen and Yancey Butler. <laughs> So, speaking of Charlie Sheen, yeah, they're, they're, look, I don't care what's in the Iron Man suit. I understand there's suspension and difference relief. If Don Cheadle's body is falling at that speed and then suddenly comes to a stop, forget all of his bones, his brain turns to liquid. I mean, he's, he's dead. I mean, right. There's no getting up from that. Um, and look, some of the things you bring up in the question make a lot of sense. Would it have had more dramatic impact had Rhodey died? Yes. Would it have made it feel like the stakes are now higher in the MCU, despite the fact that Quicksilver died in the previous one, he was only around for one film? Yes, it would have. Would it have been better for this one movie, a little bit better, had Rhodey actually died instead of ended up injured, and even that injury looks like it's not gonna be noticeable moving forward because he's up and walking around again? Yes, it would have. But what stands out to me is that if they, since they didn't, they've got plans for Rhodey. They have to have a plan. They must have something in mind for the character that they want to use this character for, for in movies moving ahead. And with that being the case, you can't have them die. Now look, when he fell out of the sky and crashed and Tony's there holding them and he fires off Falcon and all that kind of stuff, the dramatic element that they wanted worked and it was there and it hit us. It could have been better if they said he died, but it still worked within the context of the movie. And I think Marvel, it would be better for them to just say he didn't die regardless of how unlikely that is. But it's better for them to say he didn't die if they truly have something in store for the character that they want to use him for moving forward. And if that's the case, great. But I'll say this, if we get into the new Avengers movies, or if we get into a new Iron Man movie or whatever, and there isn't something really meaty for Rhodey to do, 
Then I'm going to look back at this question again and see it totally differently and say, well, you might as well have just killed him. But I think they got some big plans for him in store. What do you think, Mark? The key with the war machine suit, John, is airbags. There's airbags. There's little <laughs> tiny ones that go off in the head and it Micro stabilizes bags. the brain as it lands. That's just simple fact. Um, I think the greater lesson here is that we need Rhodey to be alive because his big meaty part in in Avengers going forward is going to be forgiveness. Because if he dies, oh, wow. that is something that is unforgivable. I didn't think you could think on that type of an emotional Neither level. Did I. That was profound. Um, I, be, you know why? It's because we talk about this stuff a lot on Jedi Council, about yeah. who's a redeemable character and who's not a redeemable character because of deeds that they've done in the past. If Rhodey dies, Tony Stark is never going to be able to forgive his good buddy Steve or that nutcase that should be killed, Bucky. OK, he's never going to be able to handle that. But if Rhodey survives and is able to rehabilitate himself, he might be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He might have to use a walker the rest of his life. But if he can look Steve and Bucky in the eye and be like, you know what? I get it. It's OK. What Civil War did so magnificently is that it made us feel like there were life and death stakes, but it didn't go forward into Infinity War and leave us thinking, ah, oh, man, these guys are never going to see eye to eye again. It did both of those things because I felt like they were going for blood in the airport scene at the end of the film. But I also feel like this is something that can be patched up. It's incredible they were able to pull both those off. I could just sit here and listen to you answer this question for another 10 minutes. That we was know, really great. Dr. Mark I Ellis love your is thinking about going back into pre-med, and yes, I will be bringing my own V. Christian. Yeah, I think he should have died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he should have died. Um, I think that when we did our, we did our uh, commentary on it, the guy's right. He fell I mean, it's, so basically, you can fall from that height. No, with airbags. Nothing in, they go <laughs> stop with the airbags. Uh, you sound like a ball bag. Um, but, but I'll tell you that. Well, it, those are in the the, the groin oh, area. Right, yeah, right, right. The right. ball bags go off. But I mean, it just it, it it did. I mean, because Tony's got the kind of technology that can make him fine, and he can still be able to fly again as War Machine, and it just takes the impact out of it. And I know ultimately why they did it. It's because you have to lighten it up because that can't, that couldn't be the reason why Tony wanted to get. Uh, Captain America and Bucky. That couldn't have been the reason why. The reason had to be the ultimate payoff at the end. So right. yeah. I get it. But I mean, if you're going to have those kind of stakes, you're going to have Vision, you know, shoot him, shoot him off, and he hits and falls at that speed. It just, it, I agree. It, it made me go. Ah, I don't know the impact because even though you said maybe he has more to do later on, a lot of characters are going to have a lot to do. No. Yeah. There's so many characters <laughs> coming up and ones that we haven't even met yet. Uh, yeah. So I think that even though I love Don Cheadle, I think he should have won. Yeah, he better have a significant story arc in one of the movies moving forward. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, we said we'd save a few minutes for your live questions on Twitter. We're going to do that right now. But before we get to any of the questions, Wendy, I got to know. What are some people saying and predicting that Mark Ellis' shirt means? There's some that I can't say. <laughs> I'm sure 90%. Uh, the very obvious one is bring your own JJ. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, by own. the way, was... Uh, Ashley asked me what I thought I said. I Come thought on. that was what that's it was. What that was your thought. answer, too. That's what everyone thought. That's, that's probably well, that's who, the else, overwhelming who else would they answer. bring? Someone else's? <laughs> Someone so what else's bring your own. people suggesting? Bring your own Vader. Bring your own Van Damme. Bring your own uh, Virginia Van Halen Woo. Velociraptor. <laughs> Hmm. Voltron, vasectomy, uh, oh, Vaseline, wow. and we also have be your own voice, bend your owl vertically, Bespin, you <laughs> obtuse jerk, uh, bite your own vegetarian, and Bambi, your only venison. <laughs> it's, nice. I am just so Those flattered. Those are great, guys. So well done. Flattered. So, Mark, uh, uh, oddly enough, none of them are correct. Actually, why don't you tell us what your shirt actually means? Uh, bring your own vodka. It's my good buddy from high school, Jack Holland. He works for a company called Charleston Bloody Mary Mix. They're right there. You can just go to Charleston Mix uh, is your is a Twitter handle, and uh, you get some delicious Bloody Mary Mix from Charleston, <laughs> South Carolina, where Bill Murray lives. All right. So now with that out of the way, let's get to the actual questions. Wendy, what do we got? All right. Deborah Torres says, is there a movie that made you so uncomfortable that you wouldn't watch it again? Um, it, it's also one of the only movies I ever walked out. I've only walked out of three or four movies in my life, and it was the one with Johnny Knoxville, The Ringer. Oh yeah. And like, because I, I've said this before, but it was like I understood what they were trying to do. They were trying to um, visually empower the, the whole idea of the Special Olympics and Special Olympians, and and make it a platform for it. But 
I thought they failed at it and it just came across as mean and making fun of those para-athletes and stuff like that. And I was uncomfortable with it so much so that I actually ended up getting out and walked out. Even though I understand what they were going for, to me, it wasn't working and I and I had to leave. So that's one for me. What about you guys? It's more of a disturbing thing than anything else and it's irreversible. That movie, you've seen, it was Monica Bellucci. Um, oh my gosh! There's, there's yes, scenes yeah. that I, it just yeah you feel uncomfortably feel dirty. It's a it's a good movie, but it's just yeah, I can never watch it again. It's funny because I'm gonna pick two movies that I thought were good too. It's Rachel getting married it, oh, with yeah. Anne Hathaway. Like if I see that movie again, I gotta fast forward through her speech because it makes me so uncomfortable. And then Margaret, which is where uh, uh, somebody gets hit by Allison Janney gets hit by a bus being driven by Mark Ruffalo because he was distracted uh, by uh, a young like, by Anna Paquin's character. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the movie is like her trying to have some sort of relationship with him and Allison Janney's family because she was partially responsible for the bus hitting her. It's just, oh my God, it's weird. All right, what's next? Ooh, okay. Uh, Alex Burton says, are Blair Witch's numbers an indication of things to come for the Rings movie? That's a good question. Um, I'm not, it really all depends on what the buzz on the movie is because despite early, early, early buzz, the critic reviews and the early audience number, uh, reports that were coming in immediately prior to The Witch weren't glowing. I think it was like 50-50. Yeah, the Ring is a little bit more contemporary. It hasn't been that long since, uh, when you're talking about Blair Witch era, it hasn't been that long since the last Rings movie. It's a little bit more of a part of the popular, of pop culture, uh, the dictionary right now. I I think the ring is going to do better. I think it's going to do. I'm just wild to guess, but I think it's going to do much better. I don't know. I think it's an indication. Also, I'm not necessarily of Blair Witch, but a lot of these movies I brought up Zoolander before. There's a lot of these movies that try to capitalize. And you're right. I mean, the Last Ring sequel is definitely closer than both those movies were Zoolander, Bridget Jones, all these other movies. But I think that it's a matter of capitalizing when it's hot. And I also think that the trailer, for me personally, the Ring's trailer was. Horrendous. It looked like more like it fit into the Final Destination franchise more mm. than it did the Ring. The, ring, the first Ring is a really not not the original, but the the remake of of the Ring is a really creepy, creepy movie that still hits. Um, this one I don't think will do that well because I just don't think it's going to be that good. But if it's good, and like you said, the reviews are good, it's got a chance. I think if Fifty Shades Darker was coming out in the summer, it wouldn't do half as much money as it's going to make opening weekend because it comes out on Valentine's Day. Same thing for The Rings. It's got that one enviable release date. If you're a horror movie, regardless of qualities, that it comes out around Halloween. I think if Blair Witch came out around Halloween, it would have done twice as much money as it did this past weekend. Mm. So based on that alone, I'm with Christian. I don't think the trailer makes Rings look good at all. And I was super excited to see that trailer. I think it's going to do better. Maybe not Chris critically, but just financially because it comes out around Halloween. All right, two more questions quickly. Okay, Joseph Meldrum says, why is January the dumping ground of movies like you say? Won't people go see the movies they want no matter the month? Um, it just, you know, you're coming off of Oscar season, you're coming off of Christmas, you're coming off of that season where it's like, if you've got a movie, th there's a couple reasons. If you've got a movie that you just cannot put against any competition, and you can't put it anywhere else, you dump it in January. That's a benefit, though, because you know that the other studios are dumping movies in that time that maybe your movie stands a chance to make a little bit more than it normally would. It's just kind of the obvious. That in September seem to yeah. be the months that people are really looking at. What do you think, Mark? Well, Christian knows people in the industry, and I know Christian, so here's the knowledge I've gleaned, is that a lot of times studios spend their entire budget and they have to spend their money by December. That's just the way the fiscal year works. So once it comes around to January, they don't have a lot of money to put into those because they're saving their money for the rest of the year and all the big temples they have to put out. So there just isn't as much behind them, which is why sometimes the movies that aren't that good get released in January because the studio never had any intention of putting that much money or dollars into it because they saw the movie and they realized it ain't that good. But Christian, sometimes they make movies specifically with a January release date in mind to counteract the fact that there's so many other bad movies there's not a lot of competition well it's marketing strategy for sure but it's also why you see a lot of horror films drop in january because even though maybe some of them are just decent they don't cost a lot to make so you can right. you can make some profit in january because the other thing that you're going to see in january is a lot of the oscar movies that had limited releases in december that pop up in january like american sniper had a big run in january the revenant had a big run in january you'll see a lot of those movies in january happen that's not the dumping ground for those movies that's just the longer run and it's the it's the crappier movies that are going up again Against it that the studios know will take a hit. Sometimes movies that they have kind of they think that could be all right and they don't necessarily have right away think it's going to be January, but they start seeing how the production goes or maybe things didn't happen the right way and then they go, oh, this movie's set for a January release because it didn't go the way they wanted it to. Now, 
the budget will definitely, like you said, the marketing, they know that they're going to have the big Oscar movie pushes for, that they're going to spend a lot of their money for the marketing there. They're going to spend a lot of their money for the summer movies. Um, now March and April are starting to be big uh, blockbuster months now as mm -hmm. well. So January, and I actually agree, agree with Dennis here to where the first like two weeks of September, as is evident right now, you don't see a lot of quality product come out. It's towards the end of this month, October to December, you're gonna see the strong months and then January will pick up with the garbage. All right, last question of the day. All right, uh, Gary V. Train says, do you think Disney will end the year with all top five spots at the worldwide box office? Mm. Top Ooh, five That's spots? hard. Uh, well, I mean, they're gonna get Rogue One. And, and uh, uh, Moana. Moana, they're gonna have uh, uh, Avenger, or, uh, Jungle Captain America: Civil War, Jungle Book, was Jungle Book. Oh, 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 I you okay, I read the press. Yeah, not, not all the time. Just like I this thought, it meant like the top five at the box office. Yeah. Okay, no, okay, no, okay, this okay. year. Got it. Got it. Got um, it. It's. I'd have to actually sit down and look at the list. I mean, yeah. it's certainly not a far-fetched question. What do you guys think? It's possible. I, I I agree. I have to really take a look at what the movies are doing now. What it, we don't know. What. Um, Moana is going to do so yeah it, it's certainly possible but I have to really look at it as of right now Disney holds the top three wow they hold they have Finding Dory now Captain America I oh, believe Finding is Dory, right, yeah right, Finding right. domestically Finding Dory is ahead of Captain America Civil War number two is Captain America Civil War number three is Jungle Book That's and Zootopia, they still have right? um, yeah, and then the Zootopia is down at sixth yeah. um, and, but then they still have Star Wars they still have Doctor Strange coming I mean it's and Moana it's possible they'll definitely hit they'll definitely hit the four yeah, I, I think four. Mickey's going to be very happy. Minnie's going to get a nice new ring. Goofy's going to get a new Corvette. It's going to be a good year for the Disney family. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of other shows playing here on our network. Make sure you subscribe to Collider Videos and our YouTube channel. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Well, you can find me bringing my own vodka to Film HQ. I made my <laughs> debut on John Campy's show this past week, and you guys can check it out. It's up right now. And I'll be at the Comedy Store this Saturday. A lot of comedy luminaries, and for some reason, me too. You can get tickets right now, markellislive.com, and a very special schmodown tomorrow. And sitting right beside me, Mr. Christian Harloff. Where can people find you? You can find me, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. But I want to give a shout out to the to the fans here. I, the fans actually made a a um, schmodown Facebook group. And they, they came Ooh. up with all these stats. And you can find out every stat of every bit, first round question. It's, <laughs> it's crazy how detailed it is. Wow. Go and request to be part of that group. If you're a Schmodown fan, it's just, it just says Schmodown. Movie Trivia Schmodown on Facebook. It's worth the, the join. Sitting at the end of the table, the mistress of acronyms herself, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you online? Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Wendy Lee sitting back there watching over Twitter for us. Wendy, where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campia. And check out our show comic on Comic-Con HQ called Film HQ. As a matter of fact, since a lot of you guys have been asking us, what is this show about? We're going to put the next couple episodes on our YouTube channel right here. We put up the first one today, actually, so you can find that on our main YouTube page. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.